Water cooling or using a custom loop has always been something that fascinated me but also felt a bit out of reach for a number of reasons, whether that be the cost of entry, the complexity or the luring maintenance effort to keep things running. There are exactly two reasons as to why I finally did it and while I can't report on my maintenance experience as of yet, I can tell you about what I've learned from the initial plans to the execution and of course my mistakes. So I invite you to join me, but beware, it might get a little wet. Before we get into the nitty gritty, let's talk about what the benefits of water cooling are. If you want to skip ahead, feel free to use the bookmarks in the description below. Depending on your components and available space, there is no apparent need to go full custom loop. Using an I.O. for example can get you a long way and in the case of the Meshlicious, the GPU placement is good enough for a lot of use cases. Air cooling also has the benefit of being a lot more maintenance friendly. All you need to take care of is the dust. If something goes wrong, there is no fear of components being damaged. It should be an easy fix, at least most of the time. There are limitations of course, mostly coming down to the clearance. For example, something like Noctua's new NHP1 won't fit. I mean, it might fit if you leave the side pedal open. So why go water then? Well, it's just so much more efficient. The coolant is so good at transferring the heat from the components to the radiator, which then gets cooled by the fans, you can run many higher end components in a much tighter space like this and at lower volumes for a quieter operation, so it comes as no surprise that this path is a preferred one for small form factor PCs. Cooler components also means longer lasting ones, making possible resellings more compelling. Of course, you could also use that newfound headroom for overclocking, but I won't get into this here as I was trying to establish kind of the opposite, that is a quiet and stable operation. When I started looking into the options for the build, there were a few things that were given from the start. One was the radiator size and position. There's only one place to mount it, which made planning a little easier, and as mentioned in my Meshlicious video, the simplicity makes working in the case incredibly easy. At a maximum size of 280mm, I was also dead set on getting the thickest one I could find, but looking and reading around on the interwebs, I learned that the thickness isn't always what it seems. In the Meshlicious, there's no way you could fit a full-sized rat with full-sized fans. I toyed around with a pair of 140mm slim ones, but thought that would end up being worse. Looking at the specified thickness of the rats, I noticed that the actual width of the fins, the part that is supposed to make a difference in cooling, always looked a lot less, to the point where I started to think that even if the listed size was different, the actual radiator size would end up being mostly the same. Even on my EK280 SE, which I picked, you can see that the actual radiator size is a couple of millimeters less than that of the housing. But all of this might make a lot less of a difference anyway, after watching countless videos of others, more experienced people talking and testing water cooling options, the the conclusion they drew is that thickness actually makes very little difference. The length is where it matters. That's what she said. <laughs> This is also why I ended up with my EK. My first choice was actually Access PCs 280, as it was the thickest one I could find that still fit. Also, after fitting in my GPU, there was very little space left between the block and the radiator, so I'm actually quite glad that the fins don't go all the way to the edge, because if they did, it wouldn't have worked. If you go EK all the way, it doesn't mean that everything will fit everything. There's still a difference, of course. You have to make sure to pair soft tube fittings with soft tubings and vice versa. But even here, there are differences. Luckily, there is a widespread standard to connect the fittings to the components. This is used by many brands these days, so you can mix and match depending on your needs. The story changes a bit when it comes to connecting the fittings with the tubes. Here you'll have to make a choice. You can either go with thicker or thinner tubes. However, the opinion on which one is better or better suited for which scenario is a bit debated and I couldn't find any conclusive arguments where one would outweigh the other. Anyway, as you probably figured out, I went with soft tubing. The reason being, well, it's easier and for a first try, I wanted it to be as easy as possible. In the Meshlicious, there's also not that much to go around. The case is so simple, there's just a front and a back. Three tubes in total. That's it. If I do this again, I'd probably even try hard tubing. What I did decide on regardless of the type is that I wanted everything to be blacked out, and that is something I wouldn't recommend for a beginner. When you do a custom loop, one of the most crucial parts is to remove all of the bubbles, or most of them. That's a hard enough job on its own, especially on a small build like this. But without translucent tubing or blocks, you have absolutely no way of visually telling if your loop is clean or not. You can however hear it when it's running. If you have too many bubbles, it kinda sounds like as if you're hungry. His tummy 
sounds angry, Daddy. Yeah, that's his stomach eating itself. All of my fittings ended up being from EK, except for the ones on the CPU block. That's because EK's 90 degree fittings were too tall, and the only ones I could find that fit were from Coolant's. Although I have to say that there is a noticeable difference in quality between these two. There's a rubber ring at the bottom to make sure everything is sealed properly, but for one of the pieces the ring was slightly larger. I squeezed it in and it worked, but not before using what I can only describe as excessive force. In fact, after the system was already in operation, I was just generally a little paranoid of something leaking, so I periodically touched all the fittings trying to see if something was. And lo and behold, around the CPU block the coolants always felt a little wet. The leak was tiny, but over time this could have reduced the amount of water enough to cause problems. Tightening them did solve the issue, but this is where my second gripe is. Coolant should have used an Allen wrench for this. The flathead is not only cumbersome and inefficient, but also stripped the paint. I actually used a marker trying to darken it again afterwards. The whole experience just wasn't great. I also added a water temperature sensor from AlphaCool. This little gadget is a great way to measure the water temps and adjust the fan speeds accordingly. You don't have to use this of course, but setting the fan curve according to the CPU or GPU temps can result in unnecessary frequent ramp ups. Now let's look at one of my first mistakes, or regrets. Before putting everything into a basket and hitting the buy button, I kept reading that you will always need more components than initially anticipated. Although I have no issues with performance, there is a tiny bit of a bulge in the bend on the motherboard side. An additional 90 degree fitting would have not only made it better, but also prettier. Turning the case around, we see the exact same issue again. If I had another 90 degree fitting, the tube wouldn't need this unnecessarily large bend. This is just ugly, especially in a build where simplicity was a focal point of mine. In general, I only purchased two of EK's 90 degree fittings next to the three from Coolant's, both of which were used on the GPU. There's enough clearance for the side panel here and installing and adjusting them was super easy. Coming back to the front here, we have a complicated scenario, also known as regret number two. When buying this set, I did take into consideration that I might need more parts than expected, so I bought two 45 degree fittings, a swivel connector and a regular male to male piece, all of which I wouldn't have needed if I just buy, you guessed it, another 90 degree fitting. These parts were emergency pieces. I thought that maybe I'd use them on the radiator directly, getting a slightly more direct angle, but ended up needing it here to get around the fill port. Now you may have noticed that I grazed over another overly complicated looking part on the GPU side, coming out of the radiator. That beautiful construction is something I'll get into during the filling part of this video. Before that though, let's quickly look at the CPU and GPU blocks. In the beginning I mentioned that there were two reasons for me to finally enter the world of water, and one of them is Barrow's CPU block pump reservoir combo. One of the things that I always found very off-putting is the fact that you needed so many parts to get a custom loop running. You need at least a GPU and a CPU block, a reservoir and a pump, three pieces that all would need additional fittings, tubings, leak tests and something that's very limited here, space. The Barra solved all of this. This magical little piece does it all and it does it at a reasonable price. Don't get me wrong, that didn't make the build anywhere near affordable, but it made it easier to run. Filling. Oh, filling is another story. There are three versions of this block, a translucent one, one with an OLED screen that I didn't know existed and now want, and the all black one I got. The story here is the same as with the tubing. All black looks very cool, but you don't see anything, ever. You don't know how the filling is going, you don't know if there is any bubbles, nothing. Other than that, you'll find three openings. They're even labeled on the back, although I have seen other people who didn't follow the rules. Glancing inside, you can tell that two of the ports share the same chamber. So if your configuration favors a different setting, you may disregard the official lettering. Attached to the cable is also a small adjustment knob used to regulate the flow when filling the port, which by the way doesn't have a hard stop. Moving the knob past the center stage decreases the pump speed again, or maybe reverses it. At least that's what I think according to the noise it makes. Finally, you'll also find the power and the motherboard connector. Otherwise, the block feels very substantial and well built. I can't say how these things normally come across as this is the first one I ever got, but it felt trustworthy enough for my 5950X. There's one thing though that was a bit unsettling. I don't have footage of it as I forgot to record that bit, but during the manufacturing a piece of metal must have fallen into the block. I luckily saw it and picked it out with a pair of tweezers. I don't know what would have happened if I left it in the loop, but in the worst case scenario it could have jammed the pump. The rest of the installation was a breeze and nothing out of the ordinary or something that you wouldn't encounter with a regular air cooler. One final note on this, this isn't the only block reservoir combo in existence. There are others, I just like the looks of this the most and of course it fits the case. 
For the GPU block, I went with EK's offering again. There are other brands, but aesthetically I found the Quantum Vector series to be the most pleasing and I believe this is the only block for this particular card that is all blacked out. Once again, it is not a user-friendly way to go with a design like this, but it does look very nice. One thing to note here is that at the time of the build, EK just announced an active backplate version, but only for the Founders Edition. This would replace the otherwise passive cooling with a second water block dedicated to the back of your GPU. By now though, you can pre-order a version for the Tough 3090 or 3080, and even though the performance difference isn't going to get you to new heights, I'm probably still gonna do it, along with the much needed 90 degree fittings upgrade, but that's for another time in another video. By the way, if you want to see a more detailed guide on how to attach a GPU water block, you can check out my other video on that matter via the link in the description or that bubbly thing at the top right. This was by far the scariest part of the build, and with good reason. Putting together pieces I've done so before on a number of occasions, but I've heard enough horror stories that made me very cautious about this endeavor. When I initially started to put all the parts together, I did write to my preferred shop of choice and ask them about any recommendations besides the parts I already picked. After a few back and forths where Mr. Shop was asking me about my components, to which I answered, he aptly replied with, this isn't going to work, that 280 rad, it's not gonna be enough. But he also said, if you must, use this coolant because it will be able to deal with the higher water temps. Now, I've searched around a bit, and by that I mean I googled and clicked on the first five results, and I couldn't find anything regarding higher temperatures and coolant specifically designed for that case. So maybe I was sold snake oil here, but I was happy to get a finished mixture anyway, and at least up and until now the system has been running perfectly fine, so I'm happy with what I got. But like with many other components in this build, the choice is ultimately up to you and what you want to use. If you want to dig deeper about coolant types and other water cooling tips, I can really recommend the Water Cooling Beginner's Guide on Reddit. You'll find the link in the description. As mentioned before, the Barrow has three ports. I went with the A port on the right to fill the loop. Not because it was labeled as such, but because it ended up being the highest point in the system after the block was mounted. This brings me neatly down to the lowest point of the system, where we'll find this beautiful piece of modern art. This is a T-junction, with a ball valve on one end and a quick-release valve on the other. The idea here is that when I'm eventually going to replace the coolant during the next maintenance run, I'll be able to quickly and efficiently do this by blocking the flow and using the drainage to get maybe not all of the water at once, but most of it out of the system. At least, in theory. Obviously I haven't done this yet as the need hasn't arisen, but the quick release valve came in very handy already. You see, my limited understanding in the basics of physics prevented me from foreseeing an air pressure issue when filling the loop. In hindsight, this seems stupidly obvious, but at the time of planning, I wasn't thinking about it. What I mean is there's no way for the air to escape when filling the loop with just that one port at the top. When I first started, the coolant just didn't budge, it stayed at the top like a clogged toilet. Then it hit me. I got a release downstairs, so I opened it up to see what would happen and, what a surprise, down it went. Obviously I couldn't keep it open forever, as it would have started leaking, but it was enough to get the initial flow going before the rest of the air got out of the system through the single top release, which also contains a quick release valve by the way, which again came in very handy for another unforeseen issue. You see, every now and then during the filling process the pressure changed and water would come flowing back up before going down again. Whenever that happened, I was able to quickly react and close the valve with a push, preventing unnecessary spilling. I don't know if there is a better way to do this, as this seems awfully clumsy, but then again, this might be accounted to the small form factor space. A larger case with a proper reservoir wouldn't have this issue. Speaking of spilling, let's talk prep work. I wasn't going to take any chances and bought EK's pump to test for leaks, making sure that I didn't end up drowning in my first water adventure. To test leaks, you simply connect it to the loop. I used the fill port for that, then start pumping and hope the needle doesn't drop. I had to make a few adjustments to my fittings all around, but in the end managed to secure everything. That is except for the coolant's fittings, but as mentioned before, it was so little that I didn't catch it during the time I was monitoring it. Best practice tells you to wait a few hours before filling the loop, but I was terribly impatient and after just one, deemed it safe. If I would have left it for longer, I probably wouldn't have done the next step, but for peace of mind, it doesn't hurt either. I placed traditional blankets, aka paper towels, everywhere where there could be a leak and waited to see if they would soak up anything. Suffice to say, there was no spillage. The pump did its job, again, except for the coolant's fittings. But I was still glad to have it, even though I was quick enough to react to the pressure changes at the fill port, there were some drops that got away during the process. Everything else went pretty smoothly, although tiresome. I got a plug to short the power supply in order to operate the pump without turning the system on, but you can also use a bent paperclip to achieve the same. 
I then continued with filling the system until the water started to build up at the top, then moving, twisting, tilting the case until the level dropped again. Rinse and repeat. Sometimes no amount of movement would make a difference, at which point I would start playing around with the pump speed, which usually did the trick. If not, additional twisting and turning at a different pump speed would eventually cause more air to come out and more water to go in. The entire filling process from the first drop to the last one took me around one and a half to two hours. If that sounds like a lot, it's because it is. I had originally planned to use a filling tube. This was another one of my ingenious ideas. Sometimes my genius is... It's almost frightening. My thought was that with this translucent tube, I could witness the water going into the system and also observe its bubbly exchange. But as with a lot of my ideas, this was very dumb, because the added tube only made it more difficult for the air to escape, and I quickly abandoned it. After a while, no amount of movement would reduce the water level, at which point I gathered all my courage to finally connect the power supply before hitting the button to boot, and so it did. As mentioned in my Meshlicious video, I don't feel comfortable showing graphs and temperature numbers in comparison to other systems. I simply don't have those. But what I can show you is what this system is posting under various circumstances. You now know how the system was built, what components are running in it, and how the loop is configured. My current room temperature is around 25 to 27 degrees. This is based on the temperature sensor placed about 1.5 meters away from the system on my desk. I have a second temperature sensor placed just above the case, which registers around 27 to 30 degrees. At those room temperatures I usually have the CPU at around 35, the GPU around 30, and the water sitting at a comfortable 29 degrees. This is after the system has been running for about 8 hours doing basic office tasks as I am still working from home using this as my on and then later off work machine. Playing games for about 4 hours, currently a lot of GTFO with my buddies, the temperature is around 61 for the CPU, 60 for the GPU and 45 for the water. Running Heaven 4.0 and Cinebench multi-thread at the same time for about an hour yields me 65 for the CPU, 60 for the GPU and 46 for the water. Also worth noting is that the fans run around 1000 RPM. This doesn't change much and for my hearing, it's barely noticeable. Overall, I'm still very very happy with this build. I use this machine every single day for work, play and making these YouTube videos. The experience of building this was both incredibly fun but also very time consuming. If I would leave you with one tip, it would be to really spend the time planning before you buy all the parts. I did fitting tests with the case measuring available space, but even that didn't prepare me for everything. Some parts like the GPU clearance were just luck, and others like the 90 degree fittings are a lesson learned and room to be improved. The build is also by no means the meshlicious water cooling endgame. The components and the way it was put together was simply the best way I saw fit with the knowledge I had at the time. There are plenty of other options from people using custom water cooling for just the CPU or GPU to the ones that manage to fit even two radiators in, like this amazing build seen on Sub's official Instagram account. But I do hope this little excursion into how my build was put together was in some way helpful and cleared up questions you may have had. I just love the fact that this has been running so well. The peace of mind that these components are all tucked in and snoozing away at their respective temperatures, it's just great. Oh, and for that second reason as to why I finally went ahead with the custom loop, well... It's about damn time. Hey, thank you so much for watching this way too long video again, and congratulations to Jonathan for being the 500th subscriber. I really appreciated all the feedback on the Meshlicious video and if you still have some questions left unanswered after this one, drop me a line below and I'll see what I can do. Anyway, thank you very much again and see you in the next one. Bye!